Uh, folks are going to keep walking in, um, but we're just going to go ahead and get started because we have very little time. to the IDA for hosting this conversation, the incredible team, programming team at the IDA. Thank you all um, for moving so fluidly uh, through the programmatic and location changes and thugging it out in this warm weather today. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry for saying thugging it out. Um, thank you <laughs> for <laughs> offering interpretive services today. My name is Sonia Childress. I use she, her pronouns. I am the co-executive director of the Color Congress with my partner in crime, Sahar Driver. And I'm Sahar Driver, uh, the co-executive director. Um, uh, I use she, her pronouns. Um, and we're going to do visual descriptions. So I am an Iranian-American woman uh, with uh, Middle Eastern features, long brown hair, uh, tan top, and green pants. Um, and I'm super excited to be here with you all. And I'm a black woman with uh, wearing glasses today. I have uh, mid-length locks and a very uh, bright, colorful floral shirt with uh, jewel tones. Um, so we're really excited. We were really honored um, to be asked to moderate this panel because these are two of our, some of our favorite um, field building organizations, Asian American Documentary Network, AKA ADOC, and Brown Girls Doc Mafia, BGDM. So this is a really fun conversation because we get to finally put these two powerhouse collectives and the founders of these two powerhouse collectives in conversation with one another. And it's happening at a really important moment. Um, as many of you know, Brown Girls Doc Mafia uh, had its earliest inception at an industry event like this, but good pitch in New York in 2014, eight, 15. ADOC had its uh, germination and inception here at Getting Real in 2016. So this is a really, as these organizations head into their first decade um, of service to our field and to our communities, we think this is a really wonderful time to put them in conversation, both for the leaders and members to look at their own personal trajectories from filmmakers to organizational leaders and collective leaders and field builders, um, and also look at the evolution of these organizations and the impact that these organizations have had on not just the makeup and the composition of who feels welcomed and safe and supported in this field, but also the kinds of norms in how this work happens. And their impact is felt in many, many ways. And, in, and um, part of what um, we think is so exciting about putting these two organizations in conversation is because um, so much of their personal trajectories and organizational trajectories track with what Sahara and I learned um, and what we put into a recent report that we published, which is the People of Color Documentary Ecosystem, Engines for a New American Narrative, which tells the story of the 104 member organizations of the Color Congress, all of which are people of color led and serving documentary organizations operating in the United States and US islands. And lots, we learned lots of things about our members um, through some data. Um, one of which was that 94% of the member organizations, the leaders of those members, are the founders. Many of them, about that amount, self-describe themselves as filmmakers first. And many of them also self-describe as women. So we're talking about largely an uh, ecosystem of women filmmakers who created, who saw gendered and racialized barriers to their own ascension in this field and created an intervention 
uh, in the form of a nonprofit organization or a collective to address that issue. And Brown Girls and ADOC track with what so much of what we saw in that report. So we're excited to start this conversation off and to learn more about their trajectories and the evolutions of their powerful organizations. And Sahara's gonna get us started. All right, I'm gonna introduce uh, our panelists so that uh, in case you don't already know them, they're all superstars, but um, just in case. Uh, to my left is uh, S. Leo Chung, uh, an award-winning filmmaker uh, known for films like Island in Between, uh, the Asian American series on PBS, and a village called Versailles. Um, Leo uh, taught doc, um, produc documentary production at the UC Santa Cruz, at Berkeley, at Northwestern, at the Communications University of China. Uh, uh, he is co-founder of ADOC, uh, and a doc branch member of the academy. Uh, to his left is Grace Lee, uh, another award-winning filmmaker, also uh, known for Asian American, that, that series on PBS, uh, for And She Could Be Next, and for American Revolutionary, Evolution, The Evolution of Grace Lee Boggs. Uh, Grace is also co-founder of ADOC, a member of the Directors Guild of America, uh, and uh, also a Doc Branch um, member of the Academy, and the executive producer of Viewers Like Us uh, that explored inequities in the PBS system. Thanks for being here. Uh, next is Iabo Boyd, uh, another award-winning filmmaker uh, known for Me Time and for Akeem, uh, who has a very long history serving women filmmakers um, at places like Kickstarter, uh, Good Pitch, Chicken and Egg, Tribeca, Topic, the IFP, um, and who launched and founded Brown Girls Doc Met Mafia, as you, know, as you just heard in 2015, uh, to continue that work and that legacy, uh, and has since been named a black uh, visionary by Sundance Institute, um, has, is a Rockwood Just Films uh, fellow, or was, and uh, a Doc NYC new, new Leader awardee, and the list goes on. <laughs> And finally, Fadiha Zaman, uh, a queer Bangladeshi American award-winning filmmaker, but also writer and curator. Uh, they produced the award-winning Netflix original, uh, Ghosts of Sugarland, which was shortlisted uh, for a 2020 Academy Award. Uh, they write for outlets like Reverse Shot, Film Comment, Elle Magazine, uh, The Huffington Post, and has worked at places like Magnolia Pictures, the IFP, Clarity, uh, Field of Vision, and of course is a Brown Girls Doc Mafia member. So, yeah, let's do a little applause for this stellar group. So let's just start it simple, as if this could be simple. But tell us the origin story of these organizations, right? Like, what is uh, the landscape that the organizations formed into? What was the field grappling with at that time? Um, and uh, what were your organizations essentially responding to? Tell us that story. Um, Yabo, do you want to start us off? Check, check. Hey, everybody. Thanks so much for coming out. Mm -hmm. And thanks, Color Congress, for hosting us today. Um, so 2015, it, it, I just wrote about this, so it feels very fresh. It was like, the best thing to hope for was to be the token in the office, right? Like to be the token brown person. Like that was the, <laughs> that was the, the best at that moment. <clears throat> um, and on top of that, it was like a lot of abuse, professional neglect, creative neglect, um, not a lot of opportunity for upward movement, not very many um, leaders, leaders of color. Um, the industry had zero interest in like, intersectional ways to nurture young artists of color outside of already POC-led orgs like Firelight Media. Um, and it, it, was, it was very isolating. I think that was the key thing for me, was the isolation. And you know what Color Congress has done for me is to help me, and, and for our, our whole field, I think, is help underline the history of um, BIPOC-led orgs in documentary, and even how like, that history is not even known to us. Um, so I encourage you to, to, of course, read their report, but to also look at this really beautiful like constellation um, image and a PDF they have that, ch that charts all of this whole history. It's 
incredibly like enlightening and I think affirming for it was for me and for all of us to be able to see that what we're doing is a part of a much bigger movement and how lucky we are in this moment to see that history and to, and to really rise like inside of it and be with each other and and you know feel good about that so I didn't know about it I felt incredibly isolated and I I know that I wasn't the only one um, so that was the field, and I was at Good Pitch expecting, of course, to walk into another uh, majority white space and was shocked, absolutely shocked, <laughs> to see at least over, like, over 20 black women in particular who worked in the industry in that room. And it's so hard to imagine, because look at this room. It's so hard to imagine at this point, but I'm so grateful you all are here. Yes, like, yeah, so. That wasn't a thing, and I was like, holy crap, how do we not know each other? Let's go have a drink. Sonia was there, we had a drink. I put a picture of us on Facebook, yeah. <laughs> put us on Facebook, and then um, a couple of South Asian um, filmmakers, including Fariha, literally the next day was like, this is everything. Let's do our own, let's do like a Desi Girls Doc Mafia, because I, I captioned Black Girls Doc Mafia. They said, let's do Desi Girls. They're like, let's just do it together. Let's just do it together. And by the end of the week, there's 50 people. By the end of the year, there's probably 1,000, you know? It just kept going up and up. So um, that's the origin story. We were secret for three years. Um, an article got leaked about us at that point, and we were at Sundance. I'm like, OK, I guess we might as well be public now. Cool. And um, those three years are magical. It was this. It was like, OK, who do you know? Who do you know? Bring them in, invite them secret, secret, like meetings, talking about how you're feeling. It's, our whole thing is holistic. It started always with community building and the holistic elements of like, what are you feeling and how is the hardship that you're experiencing? Just trying to fulfill your dreams, get paid. All of the doors, you know, all of the microaggressions. That was, the, that was like one of the hot things too at that time, was like microaggressions. Um, it was like making a face in a meeting could like get you suspended. Like it was in that kind of, that was the environment at the time. So we can talk more about how we evolved, but I'll, I can leave it for there for now. Thank you. And Grace? Hi everybody, it's so great to see you. Um, my name is Grace Lee. I'm a visual description American. <laughs> um, petite with uh, shoulder length hair and black glasses frames. Um, Yabo, I really appreciate hearing, and also it's, it's, it's such a disconnect to think about that time and this room right now, especially at IDA, but at the moment, I, I'll just talk, I mean, what you said is sort of a lot of ground for a lot of the kinds of conversations that were happening in 2015, 2016, but around 2015, um, you know, I actually, just to make it a little bit more personal, um, Leo and I met at a friend's dinner at Sundance, which was kind of crazy because we had actually known each other maybe 15 years earlier. We were graduating film school from LA, in LA from different schools. Around the same time, we had short films in different you know, Asian American film festivals, but we didn't really know each other. But we ended up at this dinner together at Sundance and realized we had a lot in common. We were both sort of mid-career filmmakers. We'd both been making documentaries. We'd both really been... Um, you know, interested in mentoring younger filmmakers. And then we were like, why, you know, how come we don't know each other, <laughs> you know? Um, and I think as we sort of realized that we were kind of the same person, we realized we had similar, um, you know, critiques and uh, experiences working in this field and also feeling isolated. Um, there were definitely organizations like CAM um, visual communications that had supported Asian American filmmakers along the way, but there really was something specific to documentary, independent documentary filmmakers. So, along with Leo, people like Chi, and yeah, we just started talking about what could we do together to sort of, you know, galvanize as a community. And we realized that getting real was coming up. Although I had no, ex I had no. Um, relationship to IDA at the point at that time even though I had been living in LA for many years making documentaries it just wasn't that kind of organization but thanks to Marjan Safinia 
<laughs> um, I thought, well, let's ask IDA if we could have a convening of Asian American filmmakers, which hadn't happened since 1980, um, at, which, was the which was the gathering that created Center for Asian American Media. And we're like, let's do it and let's see what happens. Like, maybe, you know, IDA gave us the space. Um, it gave us the, like, free lunch and some passes. Um, and, and we said, let's just invite everybody we know to see who wants to come talk about Asian Americans documentary. We thought maybe 30 people would come. We had like an overflow room at that firehouse in Hollywood <laughs> with like 80 people. And that was really the beginning of um, the conversations that would create ADOC. In the report that we just released, like Sonia was saying, um, one of the things that's really striking about the ecosystem that we serve is that it's made up of all of these filmmakers, like all of these, uh, it's primarily founder-led organizations that are still being led by the people who founded them. And 94% uh, of those founders are uh, identify as filmmakers themselves, really like people who um, have found a, a need and have not wanted others uh, coming up and through the ranks behind them to have to face the same challenges that they face themselves. So really, like, there's a, a story here about leadership and uh, a leadership journey uh, that a filmmaker takes and to step into that role uh, of supporting others. I'm curious if you all can talk a little bit about what that leadership journey was like for you all. Um, and uh, how that's evolved over time. Were you pushed into it? Like, were you, uh, you know, kind of forced into it by a crisis? Um, you've, na you've narrated something here about this, but I don't know what the tenor of that was. Uh, were you nurtured into it? Were you supported? And how has that shifted over time? Just tell us a little bit about that story as well. Whoever wants to speak to that. I'll, I'll, I'll do it. Uh, hi, I'm Leo. I am a East Asian man wearing a blue long sleeve shirt and brown pants and black shoes and silver hair, which is a strange thing to describe myself. Um, so uh, I, I feel like, and this is actually something that I later realized that I've been doing this all my career as a filmmaker is I've always had, you know, like a quarter of my time devoted to community building within the documentary field. Um, you know, for me, finding documentary was a revelation. You know, it was like, here are my people. And since I really enjoy being a part of, um, you know, this collection of amazing, interesting international people, I want to give back. Um, prior to ADOC, I was actually very involved in New Day Films, um, which is a distribution, self-distribution collective that started by Julie Reichert and uh, her colleagues in the early 70s. Please, the New Day folks don't bust me on the, the history stuff. Um, and I actually, at one point, I was uh, uh, the co-chair for New Day. And when Grace and I you know, started having conversations about this, it, it made sense for me to start shifting my time from that over to doing ADOC work. So it was not something that was different for me, but I decided to uh, use my time differently. And it felt like it was the right moment for me to do that. Hi, I'm Fariha. Um, I'm a brown-skinned uh, person with silver hair uh, who is 5'3", but projects at least 5'8". <laughs> um, and I'm wearing a blue batik print shirt with a tan blazer that has a pin on it that says Film Workers for Palestine. Please look it up. <laughs> um, you know, I, I actually entered I, I've, I'm, I'm primarily a filmmaker now, but I entered the um, this industry working in distribution and on the industry side. And I think you can tell from my <laughs> bio that I've uh, worn a lot of hats over the years. And I think that wasn't just a confusion. It was like because I really um, started to care about the, our industry as an ecosystem. Um, I come from a very service-oriented family, and actually Julia Reichert was a very... Um, important early mentor to me and I really was inspired by the way that she fought so fiercely for collective action and thinking about our, ourselves and everyone in our industry as workers. If you, even if you're an artist, you're a film worker. Um, so I had, I think, started to engage with what it meant to to be in community um, in a variety of ways like uh, that were perhaps a little more indirect. Like I tried, I, my film criticism started to turn a little more towards 
little political commentary when, when I was allowed. Um, I started educating, um, taking mentorship roles. But I think that it was a real turning point when I started working for Brown Girls Doc Mafia. Um, and Iabo happened to, to come to me at the exact right time. Like I had just left, I had had to uh, quit a job for the first time. And at the time I was like, I, can, I just cannot do work for dominant culture people anymore. Like the, it very much fed into this sense of I was the only brown person in the room, I was the only queer person in the room. I felt constantly like I was being used as some sort of shield for their poor behavior and I didn't want to condone that anymore. And here I was being offered an opportunity to work very directly with other BIPOC filmmakers. Um, and I felt like, okay, this is such a useful way to channel my rage and all of the things that I've like complained about going through for the last 10 years. And it also shifted my mindset about like, okay, it's not gonna do that instantly, but it's about this everyday action. Um, this is the thing that I can do. And if everybody did the thing that they could do, it would be um, meaningful. Um, and I think since that time, I have also like worked more directly as, a, um, as an organizer, um, again, initially in response to a need and a frustration, but I've since found how much um, this is the, that community then sustains you once you give. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I want to pull the thread a little bit on that because this morning, for those of you who were in, uh, who was at Jesse Wente's keynote this morning? So he started to touch on um, a, an iceberg of an issue, which what is what it looks like, especially for folks, uh, communities of color or fo folks who are on the margins of this industry. Um, to spend years advocating for space, a seat at the table, or as he said, we, the tab we own the table too, um, we don't just want a seat, but advocating, pushing, pushing, critiquing, pushing, pushing for space, trying to create space. And then when you finally get the resources or you decide to take the resources and build the thing, now you are running something. You're not running a critique or a campaign, you're running an organization which may or may have staff that you're now managing and, and paying for, you're may, which may or may not have collective members who have lots of impulses about what they want your leadership to look like, what they want the organization to do for them or on their behalf. And now you move from advocacy to governance. And he said that is hard for a lot of folks, it was hard for him. And so I'm curious what that journey has been like for you, um, what leadership of an organization, and you can tell us, do you define uh, your organizations as collectives? Are they 501c3 nonprofits? What the organizational structure is like, but what that journey has been like into, from agitator, advocate, into governance? Um. It's been really hard. I mean, literally, I mean, not any leadership training <laughs> whatsoever. Um, had never been a, even like a director um, at another comp organization, like director level. Um, I had taken a fundraising course when I was 22. Uh, you know, uh, <laughs> I had never done community organizing. I had, I had nothing really. Um, <laughs> I just love people and I hated seeing people suffer in the way that I was suffering. And I think I just wanted to just hug everybody and say it was gonna be okay. And, and I had gone to film school at NYU and it was so friggin' horrible. And you know, and I just kept seeing how, sorry, I'm getting off track. I kept seeing how that was per continuing in our, uh, those first like professional years that there was no support um, for, for filmmakers of color. Um, but sorry, in terms of going from agitator to, yeah, leadership, and there was not a lot of support. Um, we just kind of figured it out. Thank God for Tu Wei Young and uh, Lauren Pabst and Leo over here who rescued BGDM. <laughs> yeah, Leo, Leo's company, Walking Iris, was BGDM's um, fiscal sponsor before we became a nonprofit. So we're a nonprofit now. Um, don't do it if you're thinking about doing it. <laughs> Just stay with Leo. That's what I should have done the whole time. But you know, you live That's and you learn. That's what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah.
Yeah, I mean, I think... It could be an advertisement for yes. Walking Iris fiscal sponsorship program. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 we had support from... We were really, really lucky to get support from the Ford Foundation um, super early. I had, uh, I had known a couple folks there from when I was working at Chicken and Egg before, and so bridging that, like, that kind of fundraising thing was somehow miraculously easy. Um, but when they, when, when they wanted to, they kind of wanted us to grow up a little bit, you know, and, and also we were like maxing out um, at Walking Iris, you know? Leo was like, okay, we're gonna get audited. <laughs> it's, it's time to like become your own house. And it was like, yeah, pushing the teenager out of the house kind of thing. And that was real. it was really challenging. Um, but we had supporters also like um, Perspective, uh, who, and MacArthur, who um, kind of wanted to see us shine on that higher level. And as, uh, for us, it felt like you had to take that bigger step in order to really do the dream. If you're going to do it, like, go big or go home. That's what it felt like. Did that feel like pressure to formalize, or was that encouragement to formalize? Oh, definitely encouragement. And it was definitely like, we're going to help you, and we're going to be there for you on the other side, but you got to do it yourself. You know, you got to do it. And um, I also like had, was pregnant at the same time, so it was a lot of things all at once. Um, I yeah, I didn't. I've only worked in nonprofits my whole li my whole life, and for, for the most part. And I, you know, again, don't do it. I feel like the nonprofit <laughs> structure doesn't serve us at all. It's really hard. Um, and now, you know, like fundraising in general is hard, but fundraising in this environment is horrifying. So stay small and s tight and yeah. I love the pep, I love a good pep talk. Yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> Leo, I, yeah, and yeah, Grace actually, jump I, I, in here. You know, it's actually really interesting because I, I think maybe like we, we, it comes off maybe somehow ADOC or Brown Girls have this like master plan from the beginning. Right. It was all very organic, yeah. you know, like we sort of, we produced it, you know what I mean? Like, we're, we're filmmakers, those are the skill sets that we had. We put one foot, uh, you know, before another, and we reach out to the, the contacts that we built over the whatever, you know, and say, hey, let's do this. Hey, can you give us some money, you know, Kathy M um, at, you know, at MacArthur, and, and it's just like suddenly we're doing programs and then money were coming in. And the reason why we were even fiscally sponsoring Brongers was like four was too lazy to give two grants. They were like, we're gonna give, we're gonna support Brown Girls, we're gonna support ADOC. Hey, Leo, you happen to have run a 501c3 as your pr production company. Can you just take one grant and split it up? I mean, that's literally how it happened. But to be fair, I just looked at this. I will need a grant in two weeks. Because they were like, we have to grant you in two weeks or we can't grant you. Okay, so and that's they were what like, it was. okay, we know about Walking Iris, maybe we could combine them. Yeah. Just to give Ford a little bit of credit. So yeah. just the shorthand is like, we're basically, nobody here is an org, like right. runs a nonprofit. We're all filmmakers, sort of, un, sort of building the plane as we're trying to fly it, um, trying to understand structures. That's and a also traumatizing phrase. I've been saying that phrase <laughs> to my team for 10 years, kidding. Yeah. And they're like, but stop saying that, it's traumatizing. Sorry. Um, <laughs> but, but, yeah. No, 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 I, I guess I just want to say. I like, just want to remind folks that uh, we have ASL interpretation. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. OK, oh, we won't. OK, um, what was I trying to say? Yeah, I, were we pushed into leadership? I think, I think for us, or I'm going to speak for myself, I mean, there have been a lot of leaders out there that I think I personally have come from a tradition of somebody like Lonnie Ding or, you know, the godmother of Asian American documentaries or Renee Tajima Pena. I think like the friends and mentors that we did have were our source of information and um, advice that we, you know, and we also, as Leo said, we leverage the connections that we had built over the years you know, it so happened that Chi Wei suddenly, who we knew as a, you know, programmer at the Asian American Film Festival is now running Just Films, or Kathy M, who actually I didn't know, but, you know, suddenly there's these Asian Americans in these different um, positions, grant-making positions that understand what we're doing. So I think there's like a confluence of many different things that, realize, that, we, that we felt like, okay, we can, we can at least try, because why not? That's what we do as independent filmmakers. 
All right, so I'm super curious about your North Star. Like, what is the guiding uh, thing that is driving your work? What's your theory of change? Can you help us, like, kind of get a sense of, like, what it was and how it's evolved over time based on what you've seen the needs are? Um, you know, were you, were you responding, to, like, and, and trying to shift and uh, mobilize and change the field? Were you really just trying to find space to support um, folks like you, like what, you know, what are the various ways that that has um, shifted and changed over time? Who wants to take that? Grace, do you want to take that? I think for, yeah. for brown yeah. girls, oh sorry, go ahead. No, 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 go, go. For brown girls, um, it started out breaking that isolation and community building, the holistic connection. And then it was like, uh, you know, that if we can uh, be together and communicate and, and have a community, you know, have folks that understood what you're going through, that at least kind of helped to be a bomb for the emotional component, because there was a lot of emotional um, conflict in the field, it being a person of color in the field at that time. And the, the, the field wasn't really like engaging at all. We were just kind of having s sad, hard feelings by ourselves. And so doing it together was at least a, something that was like, okay, you, you have people who understand you and you're not alone, and that get, makes you feel empowered to go back out there and you know, rock, rock the house. Um, and it really is the same now. I, I would say it has grown to include other things, but that is still the core of, of BGDM. Um, I think it grew into how can we work from the inside of the, of the industry with the context that we had to try to help them change to be better for us um, because the harm was so intense, especially at film festivals. Film festival harm was like the beginning of that conversation for us. Um, while also trying to equip the community to get jobs and to be better at making their own work. Um, one of our first sessions was a camera class with Nadia Hallgren. And um, yeah, get inside, fuck it up, excuse my language, and also like build our own stuff and work together um, is, is sort of that next step. Um, and I don't know, I, think, I, I don't know, would you say, what would you say for like the second half? That's like. Well, one thing I, I would, I wanna highlight about your leadership, Iabo, is that um, when things are difficult and there's sort of conflict about how to move forward, I do think you bring in the question of like, what do our members need? What are they telling us they need because it's not just about our opinions in this room. So, you know, I remember having a conversation about whether or not to participate in a film festival where I felt, you know, like, wh why are we um, go going to people who have, have not created a structure for our success? And the answer was because they, we are already, right? Like, our people will be there and they need support. Right. And, and we need to be there for that reason. And I thought that was really compelling. Thank you. Uh, oh. Um, Sorry, I, I thought you were going to talk. The North, I mean, I think we've always, we, we, you know, because there are institutions like CAM, Center for Asian American Media, Visual Communications, we didn't want to replicate that. We didn't want to become a nonprofit. We wanted to remain nimble as a filmmaker-led um, group. And how do we uplift our own filmmakers, our stories? How do we, you know, have a kind of intergenerational dialogue. I think we were both sort of in the, realizing we were getting to be sort of the mid-career older <laughs> filmmakers. Um, how, is, how do we not want younger emerging filmmakers to reinvent the wheel about learning how to navigate these spaces? Um, also, you know, um, build community together. So I think that has always been kind of the ethos of ADOC. Um, as we got bigger, you know, just, Again, all of these things happen organically. Programs like let's do a microdoc series, let's do an impact initiative, um, but they were always built to sort of serve filmmakers and for us to become better filmmakers um, while building community and while uh, you know creating uh, relationships with each other. Leah, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Is that good? I mean, I, I think we actually had a really simple philosophy. We just feel like, you know, this field is full of really smart, resourceful people. If we just make space for them to talk to each other and build relationships, great things will happen. Until this day, that's actually really fundamentally what we do. Thank you.
Um, I mean, I, I can just say, you know, when we, when Color Congress brought together representatives of, uh, I think when we first launched and we had, you know, our first private meetings of members, maybe there were 60 people in the room. These were leaders of nonprofit organizations, film festivals, artist serving organizations, collectives all across the United States. They looked at each other in a Zoom room and were like, who the hell are you? <laughs> where did you, where were you hiding? Um, and we expected everyone to, it, to feel like summer camp. And it was largely a room of leaders who did not know one another, with, the except, with some few exceptions. Um, so even creating space for connection uh, is so key, and that's in some ways the superpower of ADOC and Brown Girls. Um, I want to pivot a little bit to some of the challenging pieces of field leadership, and that is these, um, this dynamic of a sense of a lack of visibility in the field, maybe as a filmmaker or as a leader, and then hyper visibility as a critic of the field. Um, especially when you mount a public critique of a film or a festival or an institution or an individual, a leader, and then how that makes you all hyper visible and branded as not that, just advocates and critics, but troublemakers, really. And um, each of you have, um, well, some of you have navigated that personally um, because of, Grace, your personal um, leadership around calling PBS to account, but specifically questioning the uh, role and the space that Ken Burns has given as America's historian. Um, did I hear laughs? <laughs> um, and um, <laughs> and Iabo in, and Fariha, in many ways, Brown Girls Doc Mafia is highly associated with public critiques of film, like the Tiger Woods series, and, and, and then that becomes the face of these collectives. And so I wonder how do you personally navigate that hypervisibility as a critic of the field? Um, and then how do your organizations, does it impact the way your organizations are funded, are seen, experienced as you show up in industry spaces? Fariha, you wanna jump in? <laughs> you knew you had to call on someone because it's such a hard question. I just wanna say first that, that that's so true. Um, that I feel that many more people have seen me <laughs> complain about shit than have watched my movies. <laughs> you know, there's, and, I, and I've heard this come up for individuals in a, in a lot of uh, BIPOC spaces in different ways where they say like, I'm not seen when I want to or how I need to be seen. I don't get to dictate how I'm seen. I don't have agency about it, which really um, just breaks my heart, <laughs> you know. Um, I think that for me, um, and it, it has sometimes been, um, you know, I, I'll say it has not necessarily been like great for my career to, to be really outspoken. But um, first of all, like, how do you live any other way in, in the face of injustice, particularly for your community, on behalf of your community? Um, but I also found that it was actually easier to go all the way than halfway. Like if, if you're just committing to like, well, that's what I'm gonna talk about and you know that I'm gonna bring it up and that if you say something about it, we're gonna have to talk about it. I found more power in that um, than kind of feeling uh, in the midway space, right? Where there, the, you're, there's actually kind of more room for criticism than when you point out something that's just like so obvious and so directly that like, what are they gonna say? <laughs> you know, that doesn't apply to every situation but it is a way that I've found some, some like empowerment in um, trying to do the work that we do while also navigating um, a film career. And then I'll also stress again that like uh, there's, there's power in the collective. Like the more people, um, the more people join together, the safer that you are in communicating that because you're not out on a limb, right? Like you're part of a movement. Yeah, I'll just say real quick that um Part of the, 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 the um, Tiger Woods thing came from a wonderful filmmaker named Gita Gandbir, who pushed back and came to Brown Girls and was like, I just did something crazy. <laughs> Can y'all have my back? Like, I need help. Help, like, help me not get swallowed up by whatever is gonna come for me if I, talk, if I speak up. 
And the group was like, hell yeah, you know? And that was just individuals, I'm sure some folks in this room. It wasn't like, as an organization, we've decided to support Gita. It was individuals just being like, hell yeah. <laughs> and um, after that, I realized the, the ability and power for BGDM to be a shield for other filmmakers who wanted to speak out but couldn't because they didn't want to jeopardize their careers, which is a thousand percent justified, you know? Because um, that's how hectic it, it was at that time, and it still is a little bit, but um, we, could be, we could say things that folks didn't feel comfortable saying individually, or we could help amplify someone else who was taking the brave step to speak out. But to let t the amplification let everyone know, uh, uh, the outside world know that it wasn't just one troublemaker, it was actually a thousand troublemakers. And, I, and it was okay for us to take that heat, because I wasn't making docs at the time, and we were, I don't know what year that was, so I don't know how funded we were at the time, so there was just like not a lot to lose, you know? 2020. Yeah, it was 2020, <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah. Also, it doesn't help that we have the word mafia in our title. Don't do that. <laughs> Don't do that. No, um, all the way. Yeah, all, all the way. way, all the way. Yeah, like I was talking to, if there's, is anyone from Apple in the room? Anyone from Apple? Please raise your hand. I was talking to someone from Apple at Sundance, and she was saying, like, she was like, I keep hearing that brown girls is trouble to this day. And that was after, what's it called? What's the um, Sundance debacle with that film? Jihad. Jihad Rehab. After Jihad Rehab, apparently, I didn't even know, but apparently BGDM is like, has been stamped as, again, because of Jihad Rehab, as the troublemakers and that folks don't, folks in that kind of streaming level, that level are hesitant to um, engage with us because of that. So it's definitely a, there's been hits, there's definitely been limitations. Um, but, I mean, Fariha, amongst many others, you know, rocked the boat hard, and, you know, that kind of statement is, has been heard around the doc world, and it's important to have done it, you know? So, no regrets for me. And well, I, I believe that there are people who do work with us because th of yes, that, yes, you know? They're absolutely. like, they, they emerge, like your, your allies, your real partners emerge. Yeah. But, but, the, but, but, also on the real, um, so there's a way that you can leverage that outspokenness and not be penalized for it, but actually some people will seek you out um, for that power and position that you hold. But there's a personal weight to it too that Jesse talked about this morning that can manifest in health issues, it can manifest in emotional issues, it can manifest in your home life, and there's a weight to taking all of that heat. And I just wonder, uh, Leo and Grace, do you want to speak to just how, h how being in that public position um, lands, you know? Um, well, first I want to say when that whole thing with Gita happened, I mean, I'm also Brown Girls Doc Mafia. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of intersection with ADOC and Brown Girls. Gita is, I was one of the first people she texted when it happened, like, oh shit, what's going to happen? You know, beyond inclusion, there's a group of filmmakers um, you know, called Beyond Inclusion. We organized, you know, around the PBS stuff as well. Um, and there's something empowering about it. When Gita did that, I think a few months later, I, I, I didn't know this at the time, but I think a few months later is when I was asked to write an essay or a provocation about public media. I was like, well, I can say this about Ken Burns and PBS because, you know, it's not specifically related to ADOC, but it's related to, you know, I always like to quote, like when Ken Burns gets whatever, you know, eight hours to make a film about the American Buffalo, and we get four hours to tell 150 hours, 150 years of Asian American history, there's something going on there. So um, it's not directly related to ADOC, but I think it's um, part of the ecosystem in which we live. Um, in terms of it affecting me personally, I, I think it's just part of, yeah, maybe there, there's some tiring things because I, I definitely get kind of looks or feelings <laughs> at me in a certain way, but at the same time, it's, the critique is there and it's, it's, a, it's, it's a pretty direct but not hostile critique. It's asking for something that many of us in the room who have worked in public media, you know, are 
We're just asking for information and trying to make this, you know, make them live up to their mission. Um, I don't think it really affected ADOC unless, you know, it's not like we were funded by PBS or anything, but maybe Leo has different opinions. Um, I'm actually quite conflicted about this particular piece. Um, I, I feel like, I feel like if our mission is focusing on the well-being of filmmakers or, or in, in their sort of survival within the field, um, helping them to become better filmmakers, helping them to become more visible filmmakers, uh, help to uplift their work, um, like it, I mean, the, the thing about, the thing with ITA that, that actually to me is, is what I'm conflicted about because we do want to have our members back and, and even though um, the, the tricky th bit there for me is, is that if we individually want to support that, but as a group, our mission is not that, what do we do? Do, you know, do we actually say, hey, uh, yeah, I mean, maybe not in these particular instances, but in something that's more sort of political, do we say, hey, there's actually these other Asian American social justice orgs that do this work, can we channel this over there and ADOC continue to serve a, a large group of members who might have diverse opinions about these things. Um, but at the same time, we do also don't necessarily want to be seen as not being willing to stand up and have, have our members back. Um, you know, the last few instances where we were discussing about releasing statements, and we have a lot of folks, you know, from our uh, steering committee here, um, you know, we, we've had difficult discussions and actually ended up deciding not to do it because we couldn't even agree amongst ourselves, you know, if we should say it, what we should say, et cetera. So it's something that we continue to struggle with. It's so real. Um, we're, we're both nodding and like feeling all that, the, the uh, tension of like responding in moments and holding community and um, holding tension and all that is part of the work of leadership and part of the work of, of the evolution of an organization as well. Um, and I'm curious, as you look at the last uh, 10 years, um, what are the bright spots? What are the moments that you're so proud of? Um, what are the contributions that you've uh, all offered that uh, you hope that the next generation is gonna build upon? Well, my answer is very specific because we, I helped launch the, um, the fellowship program with BGDM um, before that, I'm, I'm, I'm a very early member, and I'd been an active member, but I had not contributed in a really significant way. So I'm proud of that in and of itself, but also, like, the, our, the people we help support are so amazing. I, every time I see their, the fellowship that they get, or their film premiering, or whatever it is, like, I know that, um, that their cohort, it's not, it's not about like just us, but the idea of simply opening a passage to a little more, um, just a little more resources and connection and confidence um, and um, community. Um, we hear often how, how much that meant to them. And even though, you know, we, we did two years and there were a lot <laughs> of mistakes, um, I'm really proud of the fact that we, um, had discussions with our fellows about those mistakes and try to be accountable for them and, and not, not be defensive about it and say like, yeah. okay, that's something that I wanna take into the future. Um, and, and yeah, be, I think being responsive um, in that program was really one of its strengths, even if it meant sometimes having to backtrack or, um, or yeah, sort of acknowledge the challenges um, and feel like it's, um, we're, we're all, colleagues, right? Like, it's not a top-down. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Um, I'm really proud to just see so many ADOC members in the room, um, people who are on our steering committee, people who are emerging filmmakers, veteran filmmakers, um, OGs. Uh, you know, the fact that this, that we started at Getting Real in 2016 and we're here in 2024. 20, <laughs> 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 what year is it? Um, it's really significant, and I, I think that, you know, I, I mean, I always meet, I, I used to know everybody in ADOC when
younger filmmakers are like, oh, it's something I should be part of, and it's a community, kind of like a, a, a place where I wanna, I wanna be and learn. Yeah, I, I think I'm just really proud of the goodwill there is out there for ADOC. Um, you know, I'm not saying that we've not made mistakes and we couldn't do better on certain things, but um, we just are constantly getting very positive feedback and that made us happy. And, and the fact is, we are filmmakers. Like, this is like a side gig for us, you know? Um, and, and that we, we really feel like we have made a difference. You know, I, we as in like the collective we, including the staff, including the members, the steering committee members. So that's something that I'm really proud of. Yeah, I'm really proud of a lot. I mean, I think the emotional connection that folks are seeing just reuniting here, getting real this year, like running into each other, now knowing, now if you don't know, like you now knowing who people are or just not being afraid to reach out and the fact that you're all here, like that's huge. I think that, you know, not to be, like high on our horse, but I think that the work that our organizations did in the last 10 years enabled like this room to be, to happen too, you know? And yeah. yeah. I mean, I will say that ADOC, Brown Girls, and Firelight did a session at Getting Real 2018, and probably, you know, like the same number of white allies that were in the room then are the same number now. It has not grown, like white people haven't shown up. So anyway, sorry, that's not a proud thing. But also, also, I would say in 2018, Abby Sun was just attending Getting Real for the first time and came to these meetings and now she's yeah. running Getting Real. It was Facts. also ADOC and Brown Girls. So. It's true, it's true. And I think the big thing for us, again, coming out of NYU and going into the industry and feel that isolation, I now know that like the, the next generation of people who are graduating or trying to find a job in the industry have multiple organizations to sub have their backs as they're um, on that emotional level, but also on that like post-collegiate um, experience and knowledge building that is so crucial to being able to really have a career and like operate at the level that this industry needs and requires. We're, we're helping to build that and giving those people places to to grow from, and I, I don't think that, I, I hope that the isolation isn't there as much as it has, to, has been. And just like the numbers that you all have said about, and you might want to say them again, about like the number of BIPOC um, artists, filmmakers that are coming through all these Color Congress um, organizations is huge. Yeah, I mean, we estimate that, you know, we, we only have 104 organizations in our membership. There are more out there that exist. Um, but we estimate that every doc filmmaker of color in the United States will move through one or two of these organizations during their career, at some point in their career, which means that this ecosystem of people of color led and serving documentary organizations, of which ADOC and Brown Girls are probably the largest, have the largest membership, um, essentially have their hands on every doc filmmaker of color in the United States and US islands. And when you think about the, um, not just what that signals around creating space for folks of color to pick up a camera and author our own stories and tell our stories to our own communities if that's what we so choose, but also that there's narrative power. What would happen if all of these organizations decided we wanted to encourage the filmmakers who we support to make work in a different way that's accountable to community, that's with community input? What if we all have a posture around the commercial industry across all of these organizations? What if we have something to say about climate across all of these organizations and every filmmaker who we support? There's enormous narrative power and potential in this ecosystem once this ecosystem of organizations start talking to one another, and once the leaders really start shaping and nurturing folks to step into the power that they already have. Yeah, and it's worth just noting that um, last year our members told us that they collectively served uh, 15,000 uh, documentary filmmakers, uh, 10,000 documentary film professionals, and they reached 20 million audience members. Um, that's like the, yeah. When we talk about narrative infrastructure in society, what we're talking about is uh, film festivals that uh, uh, communities come to over and over again every year, watching those films, 
being in conversation uh, across, uh, sometimes across identity communities, but sometimes really important conversations within an identity community, really nurturing an understanding of the world that they've uh, come up through. You have uh, um, all these organizations that are also helping to uh, create spaces where filmmakers of color can really navigate and like think about their creative lenses, about their political um, lenses, about um, the aesthetic uh, contributions that their work is like helping to push forward. All these different ways that like, these are spaces, again, filmmakers uh, come to those spaces over and over again and start to lean on the mentorship of these communities. Um, and, and so they're incubating uh, certain uh, uh, understanding of the world, a certain uh, craft um, that's really, really important. And that's what we mean when we talk about the narrative infrastructure of society. So I, I, I want to open up, we're going to open up in a minute, so if there are any questions in the, in the room, we want you all to be thinking of them, and we'll have a couple of minutes for that. But to start us off, I'm kind of curious now, as you are looking back, you know, from, you know, the hillside, um, and down at uh, the, the, the almost decade of service to the field, you're thinking about your own leadership, because understandably, you all have to balance Am I giving my all to my filmmaking? Am I giving my all to this organization? Um, and as you navigate that, at some point you may choose to go back into filmmaking full time. Um, and then someone else takes up the mantle, right? And I'm kind of curious as you're looking at these two identity-based organizations, and there are many others like Access Lab for disabled filmmakers of color. There's so many others reaching so many different communities. Do you look out at the landscape and say, you know what? You know, be, you know what we're missing out there? It's not my role, but I wish we had a group that served this group. Or I wish we had an organization that served this idea or had this intervention or this critique. Do you see gaps out there that someone in the room might be, uh, might get inspired to pick up the mantle? Well, the one we talked about the other day um, is the continued abuse that filmmakers of color experience um, in the field and it, on sets, in the office, at film festivals. Um, folks are still experiencing harm and don't have anywhere to put that. Don't have, or have, have somewhere to put it like emotionally with, with our community, but don't have right now a, an advocacy body that can take it and put it in t and, and really cr help create change in the industry to say, or to help mit uh, mediate those challenges in a direct way. Like so then they won't push brown girls to be an advocacy organization. Brown girls can then be an artist serving organization and doesn't have to also try to advocate. We also just don't have that skill set. Like right. there are actual skill sets that some people do possess to do various jobs and, and, um, and to have that kind of support system um, emotionally, legally, yeah. and have the kind of clout that the industry will actually listen to and the relationships um, to help. Because you know, things have happened and we try. We have worked with um, partners behind the scenes with industry, especially festivals, to create change for the community. Um, but it's, it's hard for to sustain it over time. So would love, to, I, I think that's much needed in our field for sure. Grace and Leo, do you see a gap out there that you hope someone steps into? Um, I'll just speak personally. <laughs> um, I, I think for ADOC, one of the things that both Leo and I are very interested in because we also work internationally a lot and there are like international Asians in this room right now. I see them from Korea and India right here. Um, I think that that's one aspect because Asian American, whatever, we're Asian American Documentary Network, but that's a really porous definition. And I think there's much more like transnational like com connections happening that we are personally in engaged in. So I think that's one thing um, if we're sticking with the ADOC lens. And for me, per the second one is I'm, I'm not letting go of the PBS thing. <laughs> Like, I definitely think that there is real potential for independent filmmakers to be in really deep um, conversation about where all of this is going, especially as we see different, you know, institutions and structures collapsing and, you know, people trying to ask questions about what is public, what is public media, and what is the role that we have in that. So that's something that I haven't, touched on for a while, but I still think it's a huge need. 
Great. Do we have any, I hope folks are uh, inspired uh, maybe to step into their leadership, but do we have any questions from the audience? From these powerhouse leaders, field leaders and filmmakers? Yes. Oh. Give me a sec. Thank you. I don't need to stand up or anything, do I? No, okay. I'm really long. I hate standing. Um, my name is Delia. I am the program officer with the Racial Equity and Journalism Fund. Um, and so one of the, the conversations we're having internally is like, how do we partner with folks like you um, to kind of expand into the doc space and then have doc, the doc space kind of expand into the journalism space? Um, I'm curious, what, what are your thoughts around that and specifically around um, BIPOC folks and BIPOC media organizations too? You know, th there are actually a lot of journalists who are in ADOC. I, I feel like their bridges are there already. It's just about identifying who they are and, and see if they're interested in doing work. Um, well, for the practical part of your question, I think it's just ask because uh, I think pe our people in, in doc space are super open to that and that there have been more sort of like explicit collaborations. I, I uh, used to work for Field of Vision, which was at the time the sister site of The Intercept. And what was really great about that collaboration was that there was no like forced partnership, but sometimes um, the reporting would inspire us to seek someone to work with that journalist on making a documentary film, or sometimes a documentary film would come and cross our path and we were like, great, we share these amazing resources in terms of fact checkers and our legal team and researchers. And it was incredible because most doc filmmakers don't get to have access to that. So you also would be providing so much um, knowledge that, you know, when I first started, I was like, oh, isn't that gonna make it hard to, <laughs> to, to like say anything? It's like, no. <laughs> These are extremely smart people that help you speak accurately without ever losing sort of the meaning of, um, of what you're trying to communicate. So I, I think that's, that's a very open um, space and people, in, in, there are many members of BGDM um, who, who, who work in both spaces, come from journalism, um, are trying to understand like what a journalistic voice might be versus a different, you know, um, uh, approach in documentary filmmaking, so um, we'd love to talk more about that. It also, I think that's a great question because it also makes me think about how much you all are, have the capacity or appetite to connect with identity-based collectives in our cousins yeah. side, like the journalism side. There are NABJ, NAHJ, I mean, there are identity-based journalism affinity organizations that are well-funded and very organized. They are our cousins. Um, and I wonder what that would look like in the future. Again, that's a lot of work, but what that would look like to start um, connecting. Um, you're not, not prescribing where that goes, but starting to make those connections. One, that can seed some I interesting work um, but also it can start doing some fun power building across really important disciplines. Thanks for that question. Yes. Give me a sec one, one second. Thank you. While you're um, objecting to PBS and their use of Ken Burns, could you add in why, why do we have to have so much British television on American Good question. Public? Please write them and ask. <laughs> Any other questions about, um, is anyone in here um, the head of an identity-based organization or a collective? Jim, Forward Doc is in the house. Forward Doc is in the house. Awesome, awesome. Um, the coming together of these collectives um, uh, and building power together and shifting norms together is really the future of our field. So I'm so excited when you all are in the room. Any other questions for our, yes. Yes, sir. Thank you. Hi, my name is Shilpi, I'm from India and uh, I'm at a moment in my life where I feel like 
there is a need to build a resource space for documentary practitioners in South Asia because you know the realities are very similar. And one of the things that I'm really struggling with is so the so the organization that I'm or, or the collective I'm trying to develop is called DocuMandali. Mandali is like a circle or coming together of people. And I have actively been engaging with whether it should be an identity-based collective or not. You know, um, of course, um, I know it's it's easier to find solidarity when I say it's a women's collective in South Asia, or if it's a Dalit collective in South Asia, or, uh, you know, you, you, it, I know that routes and channels and networks become easier then, but what if it was supposed to be like, let's say, an early career, or a collective that serves early career practitioners across the board, because one also, one has really obviously benefited and seen, you know, um, what identity politics, politics can do, but there's also the other side of identity politics, which is really, really, really problematic. And of course, one can talk about it extensively. So my question is really, you know, um, actually, I don't even know if it's a question. I'm basically saying, you know, uh, what, what, what happens when one thinks slightly differently or are collectives only possible within certain frameworks? Because we have felt exploitation, so we will obviously come together emotionally, like so many of you have said. But are there other ways in which we can also come together when it's not really discrimination, but maybe just material realities of what early career professionals are also dealing with? Because I'm increasingly beginning to feel that people who are sort of a little deeper into their careers um, are also chasing something else, you know, and they've figured some things out. So it's a longish sort of sharing, but please feel free to respond in any way you like. Thank you. That's a great question. We're going to wrap up when the, with the response, but who wants to jump in? I think, I'm not sure if I completely understood the question, but I'll just talk. Um, I, think, <laughs> I think we have the same struggle like in, within ADOC because we are so many different kinds of Asians, so many different kinds of generations in the group. Um, and we've actually been chatting recently about how do we engage like more mid-career veteran filmmakers because I think there's a, a big need for emerging filmmakers, but how do we you know, um, engage like more experienced people who have many other things that they're doing and how do we you know, keep that going. Um, I don't have the answer, <laughs> but I, do, I just wanna say that this is a common, um, not concern, but something that we're trying to figure out too. So maybe we should chat later, <laughs> come to our reception. Um. Check out um, Brooklyn Filmmakers Collective, which is it, what's that? Brooklyn, Brooklyn Filmmakers Collective, which isn't necessarily it's just related to f artists giving each other feedback. I mean, I think that was the kind of the core of what they do. So, and um, yeah, there there are like uh, it's an affinity group that isn't necessarily related to race or gender, but more creative practice. So there's definitely avenues. Can I just say I think one takeaway is find your people, and your people might be identity based. It might be based on the role that you play in the field. It might be the trajectory period of time that you're, you've been in the field, but there's power in numbers, and I think that's the headline of the power of their work, that when you build affinity, you feel less alone, you feel more powerful, and you step in your power, and that translates into career success, it translates into mental health, hopefully, um, uh, improvement, resources for the entire whole, so I think, to me, the takeaway is always find your people. You may find many groups of people that you're aligned with, but that, there's power in the collective. And I'll let Sahar close us up. Oh, I just wanna thank you all so much for this great conversation. Uh, I'm so, I don't, I'm so proud to be in community with all of you and all the beautiful work that you do and what you've built. And I'm, I'm excited to be uh, in community with a bunch of builders, you know, because that's what you all are. Uh, you're, you're building the things that we need. And um, thank you to everyone coming uh, to listen to this conversation and being a part of this with us. And I'm going to pass the mic so that you can do some announcements. <laughs>